welcome, John. Okay, great. First, first, I want to thank uh, Mary Philpott and Damon for inviting me to uh, <laughs> inviting me here to do this, make this presentation. I uh, I live in Lee, and many of the photos were taken in Lee, so it feels very appropriate to have this here. Um, second, I want to thank my wife Marty Gottron, who is um, who is my my partner in birding as well as my partner in life. Um, she goes with me on most of my birding trips, and I would not have many of these photos if she hadn't been there to point out the spot the birds for me. Where, where is your lovely wife? Oh, <laughs> also, I want to say that um, I am not a professional uh, ornithologist or a bird expert of any kind, nor am I a professional photographer. I'm just an amateur in all both of those fields, and uh, so. If, please give me a grain of salt on that on that count. Um, I have been birding and taking pictures of birds for about seven years. Do you want this? For about seven years, um, and but I'm still learning about them every single day. Um, and I'll, I'm going to start with a brief uh, bird's eye view of the bird world. Depending on who's doing the counting, there are about about 11,000 species of birds in the world. Uh, here in the United States, we have about 850 that are, that are common. And in the Berkshires, about 300 or so have been seen, but about a little over 200 or so are pretty common all the time here in, you know, not every season, but generally common in the Berkshires. Um, and when I talk about species of birds, I talk about, you know, species that breed with each other, like robins and sparrows, song sparrows. Robins don't breed with song sparrows and vice versa. So, um, trying to get me all hooked up here. Yeah, we'll wait. We'll wait. So people can hear you. Is that better? Can people hear me now? Okay. So, um, I've divided this presentation into um, five groups, including about uh, 60 species of birds. And the first are birds that you probably know by sight or sound and that are here year round, though you may not notice them all the time. And I'm talking about people, birds like cardinals, crows, and robins. Uh, second are birds that you may recognize, but that tend to be here only in some seasons, usually in the summer. An example would be a Baltimore Oriole. And the third is birds you may not know about, but often are found here year round, um, and I include like cedar waxwings and Car Carolina wrens, for example. And fourth are birds you may not know about, but are here only in some seasons. And uh, beautiful songbirds known as warblers are good examples of that. And finally, what I call hidden birds, uh, which can be extremely difficult to find or notice. And some live deep in marshes or forests or meadows. And most of these are only seasonal residents here in the Berkshires, usually in the summer. And examples are bobolinks and wood thrushes. So, and when are the birds here? Um, spring is the most uh, is the peak season to hear and see birds, because um, here in the northern hemisphere, and that's because birds migrating from as far, as far away as South America come here to breed, or they are on their way to farther north to breed uh, in, say, in Canada or, or farther north in the United States. And then in the fall, they're here on their journey back home. And back home being usually in the southern United States or in Central America or in South America. And early summer is when most birds are incubating eggs and frantically feeding their young. Um, by now, late July, most nests are empty. Um, and but some species like the goldfinches and cedar waxwings are still breeding. And that's why if you go out, if you know what a uh, goldfinch sounds like, it says potato chip, potato chip, <laughs> what, what people say. If, if you know what a goldfinch looks like or hear it sounds like, you're going to see a lot of them right now. They're everywhere. Uh, fall is another migration season. And some birds that have nested farther north are passing through here on their way south. And birds that have nested here have already headed out most likely. Uh, and winter is a quiet season. 
for obvious reasons. I guess uh, it's the best, but it's the best time of year to see ducks and gulls. And it's also when northern cardinals, eastern bluebirds, uh, black-capped chickadees, woodpeckers, other birds like that are easier to see because there are no leaves in the trees. Um, many small birds are really hard to see right now because we have so many leaves. So now on to the birds themselves. And I have a little bit of um, a little bit of commentary here. You're going to have to read. So this is the explanation for the title. So this is my first set of pictures here. So there's going to be a pop quiz at the end of this section, as you can tell. So the robin is our most common bird. I think the bird that most people know about. Maybe the cardinal is another one. And for some of these birds, I have uh, their songs. Is that familiar to everybody? You, has everybody heard that at some point? At 4.30 in the morning. At 4.30 in the morning, yeah, that's, that's usually. And this is a this is a fledgling robin, just a you know a few days out of the nest, and you can see the. If I can get the back arrow here, the rather dramatic difference in the especially in the breast, between the the, the baby and the, the parent. I think most people know the blue jay, and everybody knows the blue jay's song, or if you want to call it a song, the yeah. shriek. They're gorgeous birds, but they are not beautiful singers. Another one that can be uh, not so beautiful in the song category. Actually, one out there. Yeah. The answering to it. Now, to talk about goldfinches. Um, they are they are everywhere right now. Um, every place we go, we see, see and hear lots of goldfinches. This next, um, and they sing potato chip. I don't have their song no. here, but this one I call the find the bird in the picture picture. A female goldfinch in a bank of yellow flowers on, uh, in Tiringham. Among everybody's favorite bird has to be the bluebird. They're so beautiful. The males and even the females are really pretty too if you look at them carefully. This one with a little uh, meal for its youngsters. And this one, I was really lucky to get this photograph. I'm so excited about this one. Uh, one day walking down um, Royal Lake Road, I happened to look over and I saw six little baby birds, little baby bluebirds, in this tree, I managed to get four in one picture, um, but I've never seen that many baby bluebirds at one at one point. And Marty calls them jewels; mm -hmm. they look like little jewels. So I think this is the other bird that everybody everybody knows. And this is one of its male's many songs. Probably the one you hear most often, I guess. And the female, I think the female cardinal is equally beautiful as a male. 
uh, but much more subtle. I have to say, female cardinals are really hard to, to photograph because they don't tend to come out in public very much. They, they tend to be deep in, deep in bushes. And I'm always excited when I can get a decent photograph of one. Song sparrow is one of our other most common, most common birds. Um, this one here was gathering nesting material last, uh, last spring, last year. And this is what they sound like, or one of the songs they sing. We have a friend who describes their song as the, uh, describes them as the Beethoven bird because they always start out with a little preceding note, like da 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 da, you know, da da. And I don't know if this is the same adult with a chick or or not, but it, uh, this happened. We took this picture about six weeks after the first one, um, and this one, the, the adult on the um, right, has presented a nice juicy little cricket to its baby. Which seems to be happy with it. The chickadee is my favorite bird. Uh, everybody has to have a, everybody who likes birds has to have a favorite, and I just love the chickadee. They're feisty little birds. They're incredibly hard to photograph because they are flitting around in trees. They don't sit in pose like many birds do, so it's always a challenge to get a picture of them. This is what they sing one of their songs. They are, they're also one of the birds that sing their name. They sing chicka dee 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 dee. Sometimes can go on forever. It seems like the morning bar morning dove is a bird that doesn't get much respect from humans because we think they're pigeons and they're not really pigeons. They're, they are actually beautiful birds if you look at them closely, and uh, they have a very common sense. I don't know why that recording was so loud, but um, mallards are our most common duck. Although you don't see many of them this time of year, I, Marty and I saw a number down at Stockbridge Bowl this morning. But um, they'll be they'll be coming back in more in greater numbers as the fall comes in, and then during the winter. And these are their babies. Uh, this is kind of a I think maybe a sad situation. I took this picture last summer. Um, at a marsh over in Stockbridge called Jackson Pond, and I saw a dozen of these baby duck, ducklings. No mom. No, I, I sat, stood there for quite a while waiting for the mom to show up. Never saw one. Maybe she wasn't hiding, but usually they hang around with the babies, so who knows what happened. I think we all know what Canada geese are this day. And wild turkeys, we have quite a few wild turkeys, especially in the especially in the fall. There are um, nesting pairs of eagles in the Berkshires. Uh, unfortunately, there's a nest at, at, down at Whirl Lake, a bald eagle nest, and they have tried for several years to um, produce young, and to our knowledge, they have not. They have not succeeded. We don't know why. But it's really a sad situation. But the eagles come back every single year. They, re they tr keep trying. So uh, at the start of this, I said um, there were three of these birds that used to be not very common here. Who can tell me which ones, other than Jonathan? Cardinal. Well, that's going way back, yeah. yeah. But that would be, yeah. I'm saying going back like last, oh. last 50, 60, 50, 60 years. Oh. Within our lifetimes of most of us. I think the finches were here 50 years ago. Of these, well, I wasn't, didn't have finches in this. Goldfinches were. Goldfinches. Yeah. No, I don't think that they were around that much before. Hmm. Now they're, now they're. They're there everywhere, yeah. How about bluebirds and uh, wild turkeys? Wild turkeys, for sure, hmm. are fairly recent. The, the resurgence of wild turkeys. And the ospreys. How about this bird? Yeah. This bird almost went extinct 60 years ago. And um, 
How about this? How about boop, boop, wait, wait, wait. How about these birds? Canada geese used to be fairly rare in the north. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember when you saw Canada geese, it was really an exciting thing. Um, now it's not so exciting. <laughs> now you have to watch where you step, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. And the Orioles are fairly are fairly common here in the spring. Um, I haven't seen any. Have you seen any lately, Jonathan? Have yes, you? Today, today. Uh, it's been a little while since I've seen one, but they they are around, um, and they are they are absolutely stunning birds. Females are beautiful too. And this one actually, there's a story behind this photograph. I um, was down at the Wallace Road Marsh in uh, Stockbridge, and, um, and I saw the female uh, blackbird, and I started taking pictures of her because I love female blackbirds. They're really pretty, despite their fairly bland colors. But um, And the male flew in and sat next to her, and then she started talking at him. <laughs> and he would look around, and he would run up there. Kind of a typical male-female sort of thing. And then she started talking really, really loud. I mean, like, really loud at him. And he kept looking around like this, you know, what's going on? And then they flew off together. What was that all about? Never know, but, but, but it seemed so common. <laughs> So where, where are we going here? It's not coming up with my next one. Damon, am I doing something wrong here? I can't get the... Oh, four. oh. Back down here. Okay, well, well. This great blue heron has an enormous catfish in its beak. Um, and I've seen catfish work on a fish and it's really interesting. Sometimes it can take 20, 30 minutes for them to actually get a big fish down. This one, he flew off with it so we had no idea what happened. But um, it would have been interesting to see because they don't have a very big gullet but this, and this was a really big fish. But he was, he was proud of it there for a few minutes. <laughs> So we basically have one species of hummingbird here, um, the ruby throat. And I, I mean, occasionally one or two other species show up in the Berkshires and that's a big deal, but uh, generally not. This is one, this is a female. And this is the male. Um, he's got the more reddish throat. This picture doesn't really show the red very well, but it's, it's a pretty neat, spectacular bird. So this was the bird at the very beginning, the cedar waxwing, and it's named cedar waxwing because the little red spots on the bottom of the wing there kind of looked like old ceiling wax from many, many years ago. But they're really beautiful birds. And um, they come and go, and sometimes they're really, a lot of them around like right now. Sometimes in the winter you'll see a few or a big flock, um, but you never know when they're gonna show up. But they do, they do show, show up here around a year. And this is a baby uh, cedar waxwing. I took this. I, it was probably you know a few days old. But you can see he's got the beginning of the Lone Ranger black mask and the beginning of the yellow tail down to very, the tail at the tip of the, the yellow at the tip of the tail. Oh. 
The Carolina wren is another bird that will wake you up at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, we're told that Cherokees have a name for it, or had a name for it, that says, little brown bird that talks very loud. Yeah. And here's an example of that. They have, they, have, they have several songs. This is one of them. But one of the loudest ones. Now, the house finch is one of the birds that is a fairly recent introduction here. It's a western bird. Um, doesn't really belong here, but it's now been here long enough that it's, it's common and ordinary. This is a male, and he looks a little bit like and can be easily confused with the male purple finch, this guy. Uh, and they're really, until you get to know them really well, they're hard to tell apart. We had a, a what birders call an eruption of purple finches this spring, and they kept coming to our feeders. We had 18, I think, at the most one day. A lot of purple finches. That's the first time we can recall that many. And this is a pretty good case or example of the um, how dramatic the males and females look. This female is, uh, she's really pretty, but she doesn't have all that purple. Did they crossbreed with the house finch and the purple finch? Jonathan, do you know that answer? I don't think so. I don't think so. We have uh, two species of uh, birds called nuthatches here, the white-breasted and the, the next one is a red-breasted, and they both climb down trees, looking for, mostly looking for, um, for insects. And um, how they avoid having their blood go to the, out of their heads, I have no idea. But it's fun to watch them just go down trees or across trees and underneath limbs. And th both of these pictures are classic examples of these nuthatches in action. That's what they do. And why was that a red breasted? It didn't look red to me. Is there red on that? Yeah. If you look, um, relatively speaking, it's not really red. It's kind of a rufous compared to the compared to the white breast, which is basically the white breast has a little bit of red on its on its back. Uh, the white-throated sparrow is um, basically mostly you see it in winter. Um, it's a really pretty bird, and it has a distinctive song that in um, the United States is basically um, the mnemonic for it is Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. And in Canada, it's Oh Canada, Canada, Canada. <laughs> it depends on where you live. And it's also changing its song, too. That's, there have been reports lately about how its song has been truncated. And nobody knows exactly why that is, but here's, here's what it sings. I think. Well, maybe we'll guess we're not going to get that. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. I don't want to do this. So, oh, I'm going forward, not back. Sorry. <coughs> so this is the uh, savanna sparrow, which is another really pretty little sparrow. It's got a little bit of yellow above, above its eye. Uh, this one has a little bit of um, something stuck on its head. A little plant stuck on its head, growing out of its head. The tufted titmouse, another one of my favorite birds. I love it because it's got this huge eye relative to the size of its head. And this is what it says. One of its songs. The downy woodpecker is our smallest woodpecker. It's not a whole lot bigger really than a song sparrow. It's a tiny little bird. Really pretty. 
and it's uh, very similar to the somewhat bigger hairy woodpecker. And the only way to tell them apart when you're not when you don't see them together is that the hairy woodpecker has a much bigger beak relative to the size of its head than the than the downy does. And this is a bigger woodpecker called the red belly. This is a female. And she doesn't have much of a red belly. Sometimes they have a, a little bit of a red wash on their on their belly, which is where their name comes from. But they do have a very red uh, on the top of their head. Yeah, and the males have the males have a full red mohawk. And the flicker is the one. Oh, keep hitting this thing. The flicker is the one woodpecker you'll see on the ground a lot because they they eat ants. They eat a lot a lot of ants. And occasionally you'll see them on the on the ground. There are two species of flickers in North America. One is the, called the red shafted, which is in the west. We have the yellow shafted because under the under its tail you can see a lot of yellow there. And this is a Woody the woodpecker. The, the, the you, you can pronounce it either pileated or pileated, however you want to. Both are correct. Um, and they're really beautiful birds. You don't see them all that often. They have a maniacal laugh that you can hear in the woods. The northern mockingbird is known for its name because it mocks, it mimics other birds and people, tractors, you name it, it can mock something. And here's a pretty good example and you'll hear it mocking several different birds. Blue jay, subtract items to their repertoire all the time. It's really amazing how they do that. That's just one song. So the Hooded Merc answer is a tiny little duck um, that uh, is here. You'll see it a lot in the, in the wintertime. And uh, this, they love uh, crayfish, which is what this one has in its, in its beak. And the male has this rather spectacular hood, which is where the name comes from. The wood duck is probably our most spectacular duck. And I'm here to tell you that that head there is not plastic. I did not Photoshop that or anything. That's real. That's what he really looks like. It's pretty amazing. And here's the female who I think is equally beautiful, but in a like like the cardinal in a much more subtle way. She is a famous uh, kind of a comma around her eye, white comma around her eye. We saw some of the babies this morning very briefly, and they're. The babies look like the miniature versions of the mom. They're really pretty. So the red-tailed hawk, uh, this picture doesn't show the red tail, unfortunately, but it shows you what the hawk looks like. And it's a pretty classic example of, what, of a red-tailed hawk sitting on a, on a telephone pole or a post of some sort. This one, in this case, was a snag right across the street from our house. And they eat mostly mammals. They don't eat, they tend not to eat a lot of birds, but they are mostly a mammal eater. But this bird eats a lot of birds, the Cooper's hawk. And it can fly through the woods uh, with its wings spread out and navigate through the trees. It's amazing to watch one go through, the, go through a dense forest. It's also amazing if you're at a bird feeder, you, you have a bird feeder out in front of your house or behind your house, and a Cooper's hawk comes to take some of the birds. They can scatter pretty quick, but boy, they are fast.
So the warboys range in size from about uh, weight from about a half an ounce to an ounce and a half. The heaviest ones weigh about an ounce and a half. You know, less than a nickel. This is probably our most common warbler, and it's one that's easiest to see because it's bright yellow. Um, a beautiful male here, and it sings um, a song that is uh, mnemonic for it is sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. Yeah. Except that it sings it much faster than I can possibly ever do it. Common yellow throat is maybe our, I don't know, Jonathan, is this, you, would you call us our second most common warbler? Probably. Um, it, oops, I'll go back here. And um, they can be either very easy to see or very difficult to see because they tend to hang out in bushes and trees. And um, I'm always excited when I get a decent photo of one because they're really hard to photograph. And uh, we call them witcheries because of what they say. If you use your imagination, you can think of that as being witchery. <laughs> and this is the female, which is also a really beautiful little bird. Oops, oops, wait a minute, come go back here. Go. Come on. Oh, I'm going back. Keep hitting the wrong button. So this is the uh, yellow rumped, which uh, some birders um, describe as yellow butt, butter butt. Uh, and it's a, uh, come on. I think I'm confusing the computer. Okay, I'll move by that one. Um, a year ago at Parsons Marsh in Lenox, Marty and I saw a nest of an American red start in a crook of a little tiny tree. And we watched the, the babies uh, being fed and then fledging, and it was really neat. This spring, we got to see the female, a female, building a nest in the exact same crotch of the exact same tree had to be the same bird. I mean, I can't, I can't believe it was a different bird. But anyway, this is the mom who's uh, sit, sitting on the nest uh, back in uh, early June. And then a couple weeks later, this was the dad showing up feeding the chicks. So that's what a male, that's what a male red star looks like. I think of them as kind of like a miniature version of a Baltimore Oriole because they have a really neat orange on them orange and black. And I think there were only two chicks. We only, I only saw, ever saw two chicks here. We didn't see them actually fledged, but we saw them being fed. And the nest is now empty. And this is a fledgling that I think had to be no more than a day or two old that I saw last summer on Meadow Street. Um, and this is a darling little bird. I have no idea whatever happened to it, but it was really neat to see it. The palm warbler is one of the warblers that come, it's one of the first to come here in the spring, and then it comes back in the fall. It doesn't breed here, it breeds farther north. Um, but when you see your first palm warblers and your first pine warblers in the spring, you know spring is coming, because they're really, they're really a neat, beautiful birds. The Phoebe is one of um, uh, is a member of the flycatcher family because they they sit on um, bushes and trees and then they fly out, catch insects, go back to their where they came from and gobble it down. And the Phoebe is one of the flycatchers that says its name, although I think it always sounds like it still has the insect in its throat.
You may have to use your imagination to get Phoebe out of that, but that's... Yeah. And the eastern wood peewee is a similar one. Um, they're harder to see because they tend not to be out in public that much, but they also say their name. Use your imagination. Okay, another, another flycatcher is the eastern kingbird, which is the largest of them. Uh, it can be a very aggressive bird, uh, but it's also, despite being just two colors, black and white, it's a, I think it's a really beautiful bird. It has a, it's distinguished by its white tail tip. I put this one in here, uh, larger for those people who think that sparrows are all little brown birds that all look alike. That's not true. The American tree sparrow is really a beautiful little bird. It's basically here in the winter time. Um, just does not look like a, actually doesn't look like a sparrow to me. It's very pretty. Chipping sparrow is here is a summer bird. It's also really pretty. Also has a red cap, and you'll usually see them on the ground. They like they love to forage in your yard. That's what they, that's the chip. The junco is a member of the sparrow, broader sparrow family. Um, and they don't like, um, they don't like hot weather, they like cool weather. So they're here in the winter time. And when it starts getting warm here, they head, they either head north or they head up. They are altitudinal migrants. And we were at, um, Mount Greylock a couple weeks ago, and there were lots of juncos there. Just, you know, a couple thousand feet higher. They were happy. The catbird is uh, actually one of the birds you're going to see in here <coughs> a lot right now. <coughs> They're fairly common. Um, their, name <coughs> their name comes from, they mew like a cat. Um, but I, have, I, have a, I also do a lot of chattering, and they're one of the other birds that will wake you up at 4.30 in the morning. Well, last summer we had a catbird nest out our, out our bedroom window, and boy, they, this started really early, kept going. And there's a mew a little bit. And even though they're gray, you can see they have a little bit of red under their tail. So they're actually three colors, gray, black, and red. And the grackle is another bird that doesn't get much respect from people, but the male is a really beautiful bird. Iridescent blue on the top. And uh, we were at Parsons Marsh, uh, maybe a month ago, and got to see this nest and the, the mom feeding the chicks. I mean, it was maybe 30 feet away from us. She seemed not bothered at all by my standing there and snapping pictures. Uh, the Belgian Kingfisher is um, a great fisherman. They're little birds. They're about maybe the size of a crow, maybe a little bigger than a crow. Um, and they, they'll sit on a perch over a body of water, and then suddenly they'll zoom out, they clatter. They make a really loud clatter. And they'll go flying around until they see a little fish, and they drop down and get it, take it back to their perch, and that, down it goes. They're really hard to photograph in the air, I can tell you. They go so fast. And here's the ultimate fisherman. The osprey is another bird that we almost lost because of DDT and other pesticides. Um, it's come back in the last 60 years after, it, well, since they banned DDT in 1972. Um, we have um, two nest, at least two nesting pairs here in the Berkshires, although the one nest I think has failed. I haven't seen anybody in that, in that nest in Lenox. There is an active nest in Lee um, down on the LB company property. 
that has produced at least one chick that I've seen. Um, and that's, that's actually a recent phenomenon that they've been nesting here in the Berkshires. So it's really exciting to see. Broadway hawk is another, uh, it's a little bit smaller than a, a red-tailed hawk. And um, I think it's a really beautiful hawk. And they will be here, um, they'll be leaving in September or so, September, October. And they will head south in um, what are called kettles of hundreds of hawks at a time. You can go up to Mount Greylock in particular and see them flying overhead. Just, just lots of them in a, in a big flock, like, just like they were little birds. Amazing to see these birds flying. Merlin is a, is a small falcon. It eats other birds. And they're really fast. They're really hard to see. And they're not, they're not really around very much this summer, in the summer. And um, this one seems a little out of joint. It's another woodpecker, but it's a seasonal woodpecker. It's not here in the wintertime, generally. Um, and they create, uh, they do little holes in the sides of trees. And when the sap comes out, hopefully lots of little insects come out along with the sap, and that's where the name comes from. So this is my last section of birds. So how can a bird that's only two colors, black and white, be a beautiful bird? I think this is really one of the prettiest warblers, even though it's only two colors. And it's, you know, maybe seem plain, but I just, I just love seeing them. They're really hard to see. They basically stick to tree, tree trunks and tree limbs. Um, and they have a really high-pitched um, call that's also really hard to hear. So they're not, they're not a not an easy one to find in the woods, but they're, I think they're just a really lovely bird. And one of the hardest to take photographs of. The red-eyed vireo is another insect eater that hangs in the trees. Um, and they'll be here, and actually they'll, they'll be talking well into August. I, unlike most other birds that have stopped, stopped making noises, um, a, a researcher in Georgia a few years ago apparently recorded a red-eyed vireo calling during the day, and during one day, he counted 20,000 calls. Wow. You would think he would get pretty tired of talking after <laughs> that, but but having heard red-eyed vireos going all day long, I can 20,000 doesn't sound out of the or, out of ordinary to me. And this is what they say. I can think of that of them saying, here I am, where are you? Here I am, where are you? They just go on and on and on. The Eastern Tully is another member of the sparrow family. Um, this is the male and he's a very handsome bird. They're also hard to see. And the Lincoln Sparrow is one of the, I think one of the most beautiful sparrows. It's a very delicate uh, it's often described as someone painted them with a very fine brush, not, you know, not a big brush. And the swamp sparrow, despite its name, is also a really pretty bird. Uh, hard to see unless you hang around marshes and swamps. Um, and this is, this is what they say. Yes, yes, we have cuckoos in the United States. Uh, it's not the European cuckoo uh, after which the cuckoo clock is named, and they don't sing cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Uh, but we have two. This is the black bill. They also have a yellow bill cuckoo, um, and they are also hard to see. I mean, they just don't hang around very much. I was really lucky when this one was just perched on a wire uh, on Breakneck Road in Tiringham last summer, I think. Um, and this is what they say.
Okay, enough of that. Uh, brown thrasher is another mimic, mimics other birds and, and um, other things. Uh, they're also hard to see, they're really pretty birds, but they talk a lot too. Viri is a, is a thrush like a robin, uh, and they're here and they're talking right now. Um, they kind of say their name, if you have to use your imagination, but they, it's, basically it's a one, one and a half note call that kind of says Viri. I think they're going, talk, doing that over an open Coke bottle. The oven bird is another a little bird that comes here in the summertime. It's uh, so named because it builds a little nest on the ground, kind of like an old-fashioned oven. That's kind of a dome-shaped um, nest. And they are really loud talkers. Uh, they're pretty much stopped talking now. I haven't heard very many lately, but um, when Marty and I went, drove up Mount Greylock three weeks ago, I guess, um, there were dozens of them. Just driving up that road, like every seems like every 20 feet you ran across another oven bird just talking, and this is what they say. And for, again, for a little bird, they can be really, really loud. The wood thrush, and it's uh, not even a cousin, but the similar thrush called the hermit thrush, are two thrushes with incredibly beautiful songs. Uh, wood thrush has like 200 songs that sings. Um, you don't see them very much, they're in the woods, but it's most, probably most common song is what I think of as EOA. Little bit of thing at the end there. So this bird here looks like it belongs in the tropics, not in not in New England, um, and uh, you know we don't. It is here all summer. You don't see it very much. We were really fortunate. This one showed up in our front yard under our bird feeders, and stayed there for maybe an hour or so, uh, and well, just long enough for me to get a lot of nice pictures and have, enjoy its presence. But they're around. We've seen them in other places. And the other bird that looks like it belongs in Central America is the scarlet tanager. Um, looks a, a little bit like a, a male cardinal. It's red and black, but I think it was a smoother bird, really a beautiful bird. They're always high in trees, hard to see. So one of my favorite birds of the summer is a bobolink. And partly that is that I get to see them. I can see them every day if I want, because they're nesting at Edith Wharton Park next to Warrell Lake. And they're able to do that because the towns of Lenox and Lee, which own, the, own that field, do not mow it in the summertime. These are grassland nesting birds. They nest in the grasses. So if the grasses are mowed, guess what happens? The birds die or you know, the nests get destroyed. Um, so they need, they need territories that are not mowed in the summertime. Big open fields, not a little field, a big one. And there are at least a half dozen or so of those in the Berkshires. Um, Edith Wharton Park being one. Another one that's easy to see them at is McAllister Refuge in Great Barrington. Um, you can walk down the path and sometimes be 10 feet away from them. And there's a place in New York that when Harding knows about called Ooms, that uh, is also, you get to see them up close and personal. It's really exciting. They're a really beautiful bird. I think of them, the male was having a um, dandelion top. 
head because he got the little yellow crest on the back of his head. So what's this picture? What's this bird doing in this presentation? This bird does not belong here. Uh, and I saw this bird because thanks to Jonathan back here who saw it last week up at Haiwan Farm. And um, we do have a breeding pair here in the Berkshires every summer down in New Marlboro. Um, I don't know if this bird was one of those. Probably wasn't, but it could have been. Um, just showed up, but he is in breeding plumage. He's really gorgeous. He or she is really beautiful for the for the summertime. Uh, Marty and I have seen seen sandal cranes by the thousands out west, but they're always that's always in the fall when they're kind of a dingy gray. They're still spectacular birds, but they're really neat when they're this when they're this pretty. So this is the hardest bird to see of this whole group, I think. Virginia rail, it breeds in swamps. Uh, the expression thin as a rail comes from this bird because it can, it's thin enough it can get between the reeds in the swamps. Um, and see, I haven't, we've kind of seen one this summer. We saw one in Ohio back in May, but kind of seen one this summer, but generally you don't see them, you can, you can hear them. Oops, I want to go back here. Um, but I was a couple years ago, I was really lucky to see this mom and her four chicks. And the, you can see one underneath her there. It looks like a little black cotton ball. It's got a white beak. And she had the four chicks there tending to them. And this one, the one time, the, one of the chicks climbed underneath her. But I got to watch her feeding them. It was really a, a really special experience. <laughs> Never get to see them. So this is my final photo, and this is one of my very all-time favorites. The green heron down in, in Stockbridge on Bean Hill Road. And I took this photo right after the heron finished eating a fish. And if you ever watch herons eating fish, they love to fluff themselves right afterwards, and they kind of shake themselves there, then get their feathers all, all out. That's what this guy was doing. Marty and I saw one this morning in the same place. I know that last statement is a little controversial among some people, but it's, it's true. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any. And Mary, do you want to talk about people's stories? Yes, I do want to. I'm going to stand up so you can hear me. Um, everybody seems to have a bird story. And we were thinking of um, putting up these stories when John has another exhibit in um, October. And John's going to have another uh, another uh, exhibit in the gallery, a full gallery of bird photos, and we thought if you have bird stories that you would like to share, if you send them to the library or to John, we're going to put them up among the birds, and so you can share your bird stories. But if you'd like to share some of your bird stories now, 
would, would like to hear your bird stories as well. So John's going to have another large exhibit um, coming in October. And those will be not just Guidos to Guidos, but they're going to be further uh, west yeah. and out of the country as well. So one of my favorite, basically my favorite bird pictures. So. Oh, Which reminds me, I, there's a, a small exhibit of my uh, birds taken just in Lee out in the, the hallway. Mm -hmm. So if you, but especially your bird stories, if you'd like to share your bird stories, whether it's that blue jay that attacks every time you walk out of the house or um, whatever, be happy. Yes? Can I share? Sure, Sorry. please do. do I'd like to stand, so, and if you, okay. yeah, turn around, that would be better, okay? Thank you. Can I come up? Sure, that's even better. Okay. <laughs> um, can I introduce myself? Yes, please do. Uh, I'm Caleb Norton. Um, this is my great uncle, uh, Uncle John Perry, and that's my dad, uh, Jesse Morton. Um, I'm actually not from around here. I live in uh, Maryland, close to the Pennsylvania line. And I've really liked um, bird watching and finding out more about birds. Um, some bird stories I want to share um, are what happened quite recently. Um, Around a week ago, I was at this reservoir called Pretty Boy Reservoir down in Maryland, and it's very similar to Laurel Lake. Um, there's not any meadows, but there's a bunch of forests around it, and I was actually uh, painting something. I was painting a landscape, but there was this green heron, um, and you showed a really good example of it, but um, this was a juvenile, and the juveniles have uh, streaks mm -hmm. instead of the um, Rufus um, dress, which is very beautiful. Um, but he was walking around the cove and he didn't seem to want to leave. Um, so uh, what we do, he would walk around the cove, but then I didn't notice that he flew over to the other side where I was, right in front of me. Um, and he perched on this tree trunk. And I actually got a really good uh, photo of it uh, with my phone. And uh, at one point, he came 10 feet in front of me, and he actually got a fish, you know, this little fish, and he swallowed it. And um, yeah, I kept hanging out there until he left. And you know, that was just a really magical bird um, birding experience that I really liked. Um, uh, another thing about Pretty Boy Reservoir is that um, I do see a lot of red-eyed vireos mm -hmm. out there. Now, I know it's not common that you see them, but I heard them first. Um, but then eventually they would come out and it, it's, it's true, it's very hard to see them. They're always just going in and out of the branches and it's good to get a good eye at them. Um, I also see some pretty cool flycatchers there. I've seen uh, the Eastern Wood Peewee, as you showed them there. Uh, and then this other flycatcher called the Acadian flycatcher. Um, there's a lot of other similar flycatchers to it, but you know I um, could tell by its song. Um, uh, this is this is going to be the last story, but um, I was actually at a family reunion um, earlier this year. Was it was it May, right? or sometime else? Uh, Ocean City, New Jersey. Yeah. yeah May. End of May. Yeah. yeah, so it was Ocean City, New Jersey, and there was this place, there was this marshy place where it's kind of like this little preserve. It's not very big, actually, but it's right by the, the ocean, and it was this um, kind of pond slash marsh area, and there's kind of like these wooden steps where you go up to it, and when I went out, it's just so many birds. Just um, there was these two egrets, and egrets are kind of like herons, mm -hmm. um, but they're all white and they have these really long necks. There was a great egret, which is kind of probably probably like three feet tall or something, and then there's a snow egret, which is a bit smaller. Um, uh, we saw barn and tree swallows. They were darting in and around the water. Uh, we saw some ducks to the side. 
Um, we even saw some uh, ibises, actually. Um, we didn't expect to see those. Uh, ibises, they're kind of like those long-necked, long-legged wading birds, but they have like these bills that curve down. Uh, we saw like the, a bunch of white ibises, and as the name suggests, they're mostly white. Uh, we also saw this glossy ibis, which is kind of like a glossy green mixed with brown. It's a very cool looking bird. Um, but that was one of the best birding experiences that I've had there. That's great. So, um, thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any a bird story? You know, one of the great things about birding is you go out, I mean, I go out every single day, Marty goes out most days, and you never know what you're going to see. I mean, you have a pretty good idea of what you possibly could see or hear, but you, there are always surprises. I mean, just about every day there's a surprise. So it's, you know, bird that I didn't expect to see or hear, or, you know, bird doing something funny like, you know, like the, the pair of uh, red winged blackbirds. Um, the other day I saw a loon, you know, a young loon down at Stockbridge Bowl that I didn't expect to see there. Um, it's really exciting to see to see things that, that are not expected, um, as well as things you expect to see every day. I, I really like that part. Yes? I was just curious what time of day do you go out? Any time or? Do you uh, morning is best. Morning. Generally morning is the best. Morning and really late afternoon, but the birds are most active in the morning because that's when they're feeding. That's in this time of year. That's when they're caring for their young. Well, they care for their young all day long. Get pretty tired of it, uh, I'm sure. But um, but morning is the best time. So if you go to say Laurel Lake or Stockbridge Bowl, you just park and start walking around and see what you see. Yeah, basically. When I go to Laurel Lake, I down. I park on the causeway and I just walk. I walk around and I walk. I walk all the way around Edith Warden Park. Mm -hmm. Um, I have kind of a little routine that I do that's, you know, like maybe two miles um, that I that I go, you know, three or four times a week. In the wintertime, I go there just about every day. Um, but, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a small circuit of places that I go to every day. Um, and I, re I really enjoy getting to see the same birds in the same places, understanding their habitats, their habits, what they do. To me, it's really is it really an enriching experience just to see that. Um, I mean, it's fun to see a rare bird. You know, like when Jonathan called me the other day and said <coughs> the sandhill crane around the corner from our house. Uh, that was really neat. Um, but you know, it's equally to me, it's equally exciting just to see the same the same old birds all the time. I really enjoy it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, John. It was great. You're it's welcome. It's fun to see all these birds that are around here. Thank you. Yeah. We look forward to the October. Yeah. Thank you for coming.